Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us for Take Charge, Advanced Care Planning Tips. I'm Calvin with Family Caregiver Alliance. And before we get started, I'd like to say a few words about our organization. Family Caregiver Alliance has been working in the Bay Area and also the nation to improve the well-being and the quality of life for family caregivers. We offer support by providing a number of services and resources, including consultations, classes, workshops, publications, and we also do advocacy work locally and nationally. To learn more about Family Caregiver Alliance, please visit us at caregiver.org. So your phones and mics are gonna be muted. So if you have any questions, you can use them by using the Q&A box on your screen. We'll also be asking for a little bit of feedback at the end of the webinar. So I'd like to thank you all in advance for filling that out. Today, I'd like to welcome our guest, uh, Mary Matheson. Mary is the Chief Strategy and Integration Officer with Mission Hospice and Home Care in San Mateo. They're one of the original and still independent nonprofit hospices in California. Mary has led awareness initiatives on end of life issues internationally and supports innovative educational offerings at Mission Hospice. She works to engage partners to co-create uh, more compassionate communities for those living with serious illness, death, and um, bereavement. So now that you know a little bit more about our guest, I'd like to turn things over to Mary. Thank you so much, Calvin, and welcome everyone. I'm thrilled to be able to partner yet again with Family Caregiver Alliance. Um, and also to share this information uh, with you all. And I see there's um, a couple of requests, Calvin, for turning on closed captioning and also um, if that's possible and some background noise that one of our participants is having. Um, without further ado, I'm going to get started with the advanced care planning tips for you. Um, we'll go for this about 45 minutes or so, giving you the highlights of the information that we have as part of this program, and then have time for Q&A at the end. Um, so Calvin, if you'd be willing to advance the slides. And as we begin this conversation um, and this session with you all, the first thing to really reflect on is why, you, why you're here today. Why does this topic matter to you? Um, why does it matter to you today? Really understanding uh, the personal reasons for this, and, and many of us, most of us, have stories and lived experience of why this matters, but knowing that for yourself is helpful both for having these conversations with others and, and to know as a starting point for you as you go through the content to make sure that we cover what, what is needed. Next slide. The goals for the session um, are multiple. One is to make sure you understand the need to take charge of this area of your life, both the decisions and the conversations in four simple steps that we've outlined for you in some materials. Um, make sure that you're able to communicate things that matter to you for your future care, and also to understand some of the myths and facts of that medical language as it relates to these discussions and certainly completing the documents. We wanna give you some tips for talking about this. For many, it's the most uh, difficult thing is to start the conversation um, and to complete, uh, to make sure you have the information to complete your forms um, and know where and how to share them so that they're of most use for those around you. Next slide. Online on our website at missionhospice.org forward slash take charge are all the materials that I'm going to be referencing. If you did not see them before today, um, make sure that you take down that email address and you can download any of the documents that I reference. The first, the take charge toolkit um, outlines the four steps that I'm going to be speaking of and has a lot of the basic information that I'll be covering today. Um, so that you can use these materials and forward them to uh, friends and family as you wish as well. Next slide. And as I uh, present this information to you um, on behalf of a whole coalition that has been working toward this, this material and making sure our community is aware of this information, um, I wanted to make sure that, that you're aware um, that 
this is an educational session. We're not able to offer any medical advice and don't know the specifics of your life circumstances or those you may be uh, attending on behalf of. So for anything that I share with you today, please consult with your doctor and your own care team about the, any specific medical information or decisions that would be best, uh, most appropriate for you. Having said that, this information will make you much more informed to take to uh, in conversations or appointments with your medical professionals. Next slide. So Mission Hospice, um, wonderful, better sound sounds like. Um, uh, why it matters to us at Mission Hospice and Home Care, um, there are a lot of courses on advanced care planning, but this has been designed specifically from the perspective of those of us that work with patients and families at the end of life, where, this, uh, where it, it's most significant that we know and can honor and align care with your beliefs, wishes, and values. Uh, Calvin said we're one of the only independent nonprofit hospices serving both San Mateo and Santa Clara County, um, and we partner with many agencies to help raise awareness about end-of-life issues long before hospice care might be needed. Next slide. And this uh, group of wonderful agencies in the county, um, San Mateo and Santa Clara counties have been working together as a coalition, Family Caregiver Alliance, um, supporting much of this work with us. Um, and we are all working to ensure that uh, there's more awareness, connection, and support for people and their families to take charge of this planning and to receive the care that aligns with their beliefs and wishes. Next slide. So why it's important now, um, as you can see on the slide, studies actually in California show that most people believe it's really important to talk about this, but few people haven't. Um, few people have actually spoken about this. Nearly 90% of doctors are not comfortable starting this conversation. Um, it doesn't mean that they don't want to have it with you, but there are sensitivities in the healthcare profession of raising it with a patient. And so uh, that's another reason to take charge of it yourself by having this information and taking it to and initiating the conversation with your healthcare providers. Um, that's been found to be the most uh, effective way to start the conversation. Um, a lot of people think that the doctor will raise it with you when it's time. And unfortunately, statistics show that's not the case. And certainly COVID-19 has increased the awareness of and need for ourselves exploring what would matter most to us and um, ensuring that those around us know if we would want to be hospitalized or uh, fortunately that the numbers have shifted dramatically in the last few years. Um, but understanding uh, some of the medical interventions that could take place if we had a serious illness. Next slide. What many people don't know is that without clear direction, healthcare professionals, medical teams are required by law to do everything possible to sustain life. And sustaining life may not necessarily align with our own personal choices or preferences around the quality of life that would matter to us. Um, and that's really what this, this whole topic area is about, helping to define what quality of life is for you, so that others around can align the care and decisions um, in a crisis if needed. Uh, it's also easier to learn about these things. And some have said you could practically get a PhD in end of life issues. Um, the worst time to start to learn uh, this information is during, is actually when it's needed most, during a crisis if someone can't speak for themselves, when someone's being rushed to emergency. Um, this is information to learn, to review, to reflect on, um, and to stay informed about in an ongoing way so that it is there um, like a very important umbrella um, in the case of a crisis. Planning ahead can also, um, evidence shows, ensure that your wishes will be followed and prepare your relatives um, from guessing about the care that you would or wouldn't want. There's also research that shows that although um, 
grief is universal after um, a death or even with anticipatory grief with a serious illness. Um, nothing changes grief. That's, um, that's human uh, emotion and reaction to loss um, and very appropriate. So, but advanced care planning has been shown to minimize the, um, the impact um, of uh, a grief and the intensity uh, if care has been aligned to what someone wanted, um, then it's a much, uh, a much more stand, uh, universal process of grieving rather than the added burden of grief if uh, care does not align to what someone would have wanted. Next slide. So to overview uh, what is advanced care planning, a lot of people think it's a form. Um, there's a lot in the media about forms and it's actually much more than a form. Advanced care planning is a process. Um, they're called advanced directives. And so it's a process where you can direct the care you would choose or not in advance of a crisis to be used to guide your care in the event you couldn't speak for yourself. So it's only used in the event you couldn't speak for yourself, but it's a way you can direct in advance of a crisis or need the care that you would choose. It's also a tool to help you take charge of this area, to have some control in it by doing this, and also to communicate the choices to healthcare professionals and to loved ones alike in a written form, in a written document, and in conversations. And it's an opportunity as I mentioned, for you and your family, however you define family, um, to gain as much peace of mind as possible, both in advance, as we're doing this in advance of need, but also during uh, serious illness or end of life care. Uh, myself and many who have lived this experience uh, with family members um, have actually used their advanced directives ongoingly as uh, symptoms might change or diagnosis changes um, to update and have more in-depth conversations about what would be wanted, as well as I mentioned after end-of-life care um, to support uh, the, those who came together to support your wishes and values um, can benefit from that even after a death. So it's much more than a form. Next slide. So the Advanced Healthcare Directive, Advanced Healthcare Directive is the name for the documents. Um, the process is advanced care planning and the documents are uh, again, only used if you're unable to speak for yourself. So long as you can speak for yourself, uh, the healthcare team is required to ask your input for care um, and to have conversations so that you can make informed decisions. But if for any reason you're unable to speak for yourself, these documents give guidance for future healthcare decisions, and also most significantly appoint a healthcare agent, also sometimes called a surrogate decision maker, someone who will be the person who legally has the authority to speak on your behalf if you're unable to do so yourself. Next slide. And some people think this is just for sometime later, for someone else, we don't have to talk about it yet, it's too soon. Well, actually, anyone in uh, certainly in the state of California and the country, um, anyone 18 years or older should have an advanced directive. Now, someone's advanced directive at 18 may be very different than someone at 81. Um, but at 18 years of age, you are considered a legal adult. And as such, all the confidentiality requirements in healthcare systems um, mean that someone else needs to be designated. Your, your parents, the parents of an 18 year old um, should be named an advance directive for an 18 year old or anyone older in case of an emergency, an accident, et cetera. Um, it's to ensure that your wishes will be known. Um, some of the most difficult situations families are put in is not knowing what someone would have wanted, what a loved one would have wanted or um, disagreeing about that because it wasn't clear. Um, again, it's only used if you're unable to express your decisions, unable to speak for yourself, um, but that can actually happen to anyone at any age at any time um, due to a head injury, 
uh, diagnosis of dementia, medications, stroke. Um, these are uh, unfortunately um, not unusual occurrences. And so it's not only as we're thinking of someone who is uh, potentially uh, older or frail um, at the end of their life, um, it can happen at any time, which is why these things are important to have in place. The conversation about these uh, can make a significant difference in giving um, those around you and yourself uh, more peace of mind about the possibilities of um, what can happen and your choices and rights in them. Next slide. So the process, as I mentioned, and this is outlined in your um, Take Charge Toolkit that you can download from our website, uh, but there are four key steps. Think about what matters to you. Talk about your wishes with your family and friends. Choose your healthcare agent and write it down and share your plan. So I'm going to go quickly through each of these steps with some tips. Please take some notes um, as we go through this. And again, any questions continue to put in the Q&A. Uh, we will do that again, Thomas. Next slide. So step one is think about what matters most to you and what kind of care you would want if you were unable to speak for yourself. Next slide. So what most people um, assume is that healthcare professionals in an emergency situation, if a patient wasn't able to speak for themselves, would want things done that um, would maintain their current or better quality of life. It's kind of an unspoken assumption. Um, and what people have found, uh, given the requirements of healthcare professionals to do everything necessary to save or sustain life, that many of the interventions actually don't um, support or may go against the quality of life that would matter to you. But quality of life is very individual and it can change over time how we define that. But the first step in advanced care planning is really looking at and exploring what gives your life meaning today? What are the things that give you quality of life? And how would you define uh, quality of life for yourself that you would want maintained or extended? Or are there uh, times when um, you would prefer treatments not be done if your quality of life would be, if the outcome would be worse. Next slide. So in the, in the toolkit and, and these questions here, um, there's some things to reflect on. Again, um, not easy questions to face sometimes, but this is the, the really important questions to ask yourself and be part of communicating in your advanced care plan. What's most important in your life today? For some, it's, it's family or connections, friends. For others, it may be being able to live on your own, being independent. Um, I know for some, uh, my own mother, uh, that as she was uh, aging and after my father had died, um, in addition to friends and, and family, it was being able to look outside the window and see nature. Um, and for some, it may be uh, particular beliefs or practices. You can also reflect on what experiences you've had with serious illness or others' deaths. Do those experiences inform for you what quality of life means to you? Many have examples of things that they would never have chosen had they known in advance. And given that, can you imagine health experiences worse than death? In the state of California, there's been surveys done and um, about 75% of those surveyed, and it was a wide survey in the state, uh, stated that they would prefer quality over quantity of life. And if that's something that you would agree with, then how would you define quality um, versus quantity? Is it most important to you to live as long as possible, even with a certain level of pain or disability? Would it be most important to you to try some treatments if they were available for a period of time, but stop if you were suffering or not getting better? Or to focus on quality of life and comfort, even if your life were to be shorter? 
again, if you were um, not expected to recover, would your focus on quality of life and comfort, or would you prefer to continue treatments for as long as possible or for a set period of time and have it reviewed? Those are some broad brushstrokes of decision-making. It's really important for you to clarify for yourself first and then in conversations with others. Next slide. Spiritual, cultural, and religious beliefs can also uh, play a big part in um, the supports that you might choose or absolutely not choose. Um, and also the decision-making for medical treatments or care for yourself or those you're caring for. Um, many families have a, a wide spectrum of either religious beliefs, values, or practices. Um, many of us uh, were raised with a certain belief or tradition that has changed over the years. So it's important to consider um, if this area is something that gives you peace or strength in difficult times, is not an area that is of importance to you um, or could actually be harmful to you given past experience um, if others were to, uh, for instance, have uh, a spiritual leader visit or be consulted in your care. There are also cultural and family considerations. I often say, um, think about major events in your um, family or your culture. Um, are they large events? Are they uh, very private events? Are there certain people who are often uh, bestowed upon for decision making? Um, oftentimes, those uh, parallels are similar in who would be included, um, what kinds of processes or cultural traditions there may be around illness, um, end of life care, even funerals. And all of these can impact um, the emotional or spiritual well being for yourself and those around you, um, as well as uh, the significant beliefs about life and death, and the, uh, some traditions and belief systems um, have significant ethical considerations for medical treatments. So, if spiritual, cultural, or religious beliefs are um, a part of what gives your life meaning and your quality of life, those are things to explore and communicate as well as part of your advanced care plan. Next slide. There are some uh, tools that can help you um, to clarify this area. Um, these are some things to reflect on. These are statements on a deck of cards that have been designed um, actually in uh, Northern California um, by a group and we use them in our in-person workshops. Um, most people can relate to these statements and to clarify if they are important to you, if they're not important to you and what that would mean for someone to act upon. Um, and the next slide will give the link to the website. Next slide, please. Um, oh, sorry, the, the, the link is not there. Thank you, Calvin, for the quick, quick slide back and forth. Um, the, the website that you'd want to go to to explore these um, phrases further is gowish.org, www.gowish.org. We can put that in the chat as well and send that out after the session. Um, but there is a, an online solitaire game and there is also a deck of cards that have many phrases that people have said mattered to them um, at the end of life. And it's a great way to have specific phrases for you as well. Thank you, next slide. Thank you very much. So um, it's also important in thinking about what matters to you to understand medical language. Um, and this is very high level um, aligned to those phrases of would you rather have treatment options no matter what? Would you also, um, would you like to have medical treatments offered for a short period of time? Or would you prefer um, if you uh, weren't anticipated to improve or recover, would you prefer comfort care? And so the medical language in advanced care planning kind of runs the gamut from two two extremes and everything in between. The one extreme is quote unquote, do everything you can. 
when the time comes that medical treatments can't prevent death, um, medicine can sometimes postpone it by artificial means. Um, and those artificial means are um, used when someone can improve, but also um, shown not to be as effective when someone is a frail elderly person, um, has a chronic, multiple chronic conditions or anything that may have um, impacted their, their vibrant health um, at an earlier time or a different time in their life. And those artificial means, um, cardio, cardiopulmonary resuscitation, intubation, ventilation, and artificial feeding. These are all things that in your advanced care planning, you can make choices around. Um, and without an advanced healthcare directive, this is what healthcare staff are required to do. Um, to offer an uh, CPR, um, including intubation and mechanical ventilation if needed to get breathing uh, going again, to attempt to start the heart um, and uh, artificial feeding. Next slide. So those top three interventions, and we, none of us can know what the circumstances may be, but the top three medical interventions in an emergency setting are these three. And asking your healthcare professionals, what would they mean for your care if you're living with a serious illness now, if you are living with chronic conditions? Um, what are the potential? This is a really key question to ask. What for any intervention or treatment, um, what are the potential benefits, the potential challenges, and the potential outcomes for your age group or condition? Um, and to ask those questions when you're well um, and use them to inform your decision-making or the guidance you would like around them. For instance, if the, um, and, and most people I will just add on, um, the television shows, all the healthcare emergency medicine shows, um, people tend to, if their heart stops beating, they get cardiopulmonary resuscitation and they're going out to dinner the next evening. Um, the reality in, um, in healthcare is actually for someone who's seriously ill, um, for someone who's frail elderly, for someone who's living with uh, cancer that is not improving, um, the success rates for cardiopulmonary resuscitation uh, are much less than uh, even 10 or 15%. And success means survival, not necessarily quality of life. Many who are ill or living with multiple conditions, or again, the frail and elderly, um, they don't always go together frail and elderly, but if there is a frail elderly, which means the bone density is diminishing, um, the muscle strength and the, uh, the organs, um, the success rate is, uh, and the, the multiple complications after um, cardiopulmonary resuscitation or ventilation and intubation, um, there oftentimes can be other issues of brain or function or ability to um, remain mobile on their own. So these are things to uh, not trust television. <laughs> um, and to actually learn the, the statistics and the choices for yourself. Next slide. And we have seen um, uh, now most um, of what these interventions look like, um, but the important thing to also be aware of is if there is um, cardiac compression and um, intubation, and certainly with ventilation, that is also a time when you may not be able to speak for yourself because of the interventions. So you would want to make sure that your wishes were known in advance of um, emergency situations. Next slide. So this is just restating what, um, what don't actually, uh, many aren't aware of, but um, for a young, healthy person, um, even for someone, uh, for whom the, uh, someone to stop breathing out in the community and someone immediately to be there with an uh, automatic defibrillator or CPR, um, strong, healthy, caught uh, within 
uh, less than minutes. Um, that's what CPR can really be beneficial for. Most of the time with the, the patient population that we're talking about, um, CPR is not successful. Um, and so it's really important in the decision-making process to consider what you would want or never choose around these interventions. Next slide. And here are some phrases. This was specifically for um, hospitalization considerations early on in COVID-19. Um, and actually they relate to advanced care planning in general for any condition, for any potentially um, life limiting uh, uh, challenge. Um, if I will die, if I do not receive the interventions, would you want them? And if the likelihood is that I would not regain my current or defined quality of life, which is why it's so important to define that for yourself. If I would not regain my current or defined quality of life, would I want this or would I not want this? If I would, if the likelihood is that I will regain my current or defined quality of life, then that's something that you can choose or choose not to, but those are very strong statements that would be helpful as guidance um, for those around you. Next slide. And I know this is going very quickly. Um, happy to answer questions at the end. So as I mentioned, there's two kind of extremes. Um, do everything you can and allow a natural death. And the allow a natural death at the other end of the spectrum is the option to not choose artificial measures, but allow death to occur naturally and focus on the comfort and quality of life until death comes. This is the approach of palliative and hospice care. And this is the focus and the specialty of both palliative and hospice care. Next slide. The expertise of both, and these are both medical specialties, um, the focus is on max, maximizing quality of over quantity of life. The care is directed toward relieving symptoms, not curing the illness. Um, the, the symptom relief can be pain. Um, palliative and hospice care have expertise in pain management, um, shortness of breath, um, using medications and non-medical means and uh, comfort. The, in conjunction with other treatments, so palliative care may be used as early as right after a diagnosis, um, is available at all hospitals in our area, and, um, but also make sure you take charge and request a consult in palliative care um, if needed or if you think it could be beneficial. And in some community clinics, there are a couple of differences between palliative and um, hospice care. And one is that palliative care Healthcare coverage varies by your insurance. And hospice care, although it is palliative care, it is focused on comfort, it does have an interdisciplinary team, it is currently a Medicare benefit um, that is available in your last six months of life and delivered wherever you are. So, one difference is that palliative care is based on your. Your, your coverage will vary and your um, access may vary depending on if it's in the community or in the hospital. Hospice care is a paid Medicare benefit. You've already paid for it if you're over 65 or on disability. It's available um, for those with a diagnosis. If uh, treatment were not continued with the natural occurrence, the natural progression of the condition or illness, um, uh, the predictions be that um, you would not live more than six months. Um, that is not an exact science. And so it's possible to extend the hospice benefit um, so long as the, the level of care is still required and it's delivered wherever you are. So hospice care is generally delivered in your home or care home. Next slide. So anything that is focused on the comfort um, 
uh, versus the extension of life. You can request palliative care in addition to any treatments. You can request hospice care and choose any hospice you wish, even if your doctor doesn't bring this up. Um, all hospice is palliative care, but not all palliative care is hospice. Next slide. So we spent the most time on step one because that's the step that is often neglected. Um, for the next couple of steps, I'm going to share with you some tools and some tips on how to uh, both talk about your wishes with your family, friends, and doctors, um, choose your healthcare agent, and shoot your plans. So step two is how to talk about this. And I see there's a, a comment in the um, Q&A about one of the tools that in fact, yes, we do recommend in here. Um, next slide. So first you wanna be sure that um, once you've explored your wishes, uh, thought about some of the medical decision-making, um, you wanna make sure that you're talking to your family, your designated family, those closest to you and, um, and or friends who are closest to you, your doctors and healthcare providers and anyone who might be involved in your healthcare decisions. And in part, you're talking with family and friends to also ascertain um, who might be the best healthcare agent for you. Um, and we'll talk about that in step three. But how to start the conversation. There are a number of tips. Um, there are two, and these are also written in the Take Charge Toolkit. One is just many times people are concerned that it means um, in, our, in our culture, um, and in many cultures, people are concerned if you start talking about wishes for your future care or end of life care, it means something seriously wrong and you're just not saying it. Um, so it's often helpful to say, if this is true for you, even though I'm okay now, I wanna be prepared for the future. Or I wanna make sure what happened with so-and-so's family or with our family in the past, um, that we prevent misunderstandings and that we have this conversation. It's important to me. Um, another way to start it is I attended this workshop today and they said we should all be starting to talk about our wishes for medical care. And there are some other tips in the toolkit as well. Um, and next slide, there are some uh, additional tools that we recommend. Um, and these can also be um, the conversation starter kit can be accessed via our website or the conversation project, which also has a number of um, videos and materials in different languages as well. Um, the conversation project starter kit has some more wonderful questions about um, decision making, how you would how you would name and um, communicate what quality of life means to you. Um, what kinds of care or treatment you would want under certain circumstances. So there's a number of different uh, resources in there. You can complete it and use that guide and share it with your uh, friends and family to have a conversation about. Um, you can also complete the information there and attach it to your advanced directive as some additional information. Another is the Stanford Letter Project, um, right in our own backyard, a wonderful, uh, set of resources and videos um, that a physician at Stanford um, began as a, a project and it is now um, gone viral and is, uh, has research evidence-based, but they've turned the legal document into a, uh, an online form that you could complete that just starts with your doctor. Under these circumstances, I would wish or never choose these things and there, there are blank places where you can complete the letter. Um, if you're a patient at Stanford, you can have that uploaded into your health records. If you are not, you can download um, the form and print it um, or email it to uh, your physician again as a support and as a way to start the conversation with your doctor. So think about what would work best for you uh, to start talking with others about this. It could be the Go Wish cards I mentioned. It could be the Take Charge Toolkit or these resources as well. Um, and it could even be humor. Um, so there are a lot of different ways to start this conversation. And there are videos on each of these websites, including ours, uh, that might be useful to, to watch and to share with others as well. Next slide. 
we wanted to make sure you have some tools for how to start the conversation. Um, and, and then the most significant conversation you will have is the person who you are choosing to be your healthcare agent, the person that you want to make decisions about your care um, if you're not able to speak for yourself. Next slide. Your healthcare agent should be someone who knows your wishes and values, will respect them even if they're different from their own, can be a strong advocate for what matters to you and can be calm in a crisis. Now, many people, um, if they've done their advanced directive, maybe as part of their estate planning or um, maybe years ago, people were completing forms and putting someone's name in as their, as their healthcare agent and never talking to them about it. And that's in part why projects like the Conversation Project and others are raising awareness about the fact that this is a conversation, not just a form as is our program. Um, because your healthcare agent is the person that you legally designate on the forms that hospital and healthcare professionals can talk to about your medical care, can talk to about the, the pros and cons of treatment, and that they have the legal authority to make decisions based on that information, should you not be able to speak for yourself. They are your point person. They are your spokesperson. And it would be very difficult for someone to make those decisions confidently without knowing what matters to you, without having had the conversations about quality of life and potential medical interventions, et cetera. Next slide. So you want to have thought about what matters to you. Know how you can start the conversation with others. Choose your healthcare agent and talk to them about the things that matter to you. Have conversations, have dialogue with them. When we were doing in-person workshops, we had the healthcare agent attend with the, um, the person completing the advanced directive so that they could learn and explore this alongside. And step four is to write it down and document your decisions and share this with both your healthcare agent, your healthcare team, and your loved ones. Next slide. So the importance in writing it down and sharing your plan is that this, again, if you're not able to speak for yourself, you have written documentation of this and you have legally designated your healthcare agent. In California, the Advanced Healthcare Directive is the form to legally appoint this healthcare agent and it is a legal document and also to um, add guidance for your medical team. And the Physician Order for Life-Sustaining Treatment, the POLST form, is another form of an advanced directive in addition to the first that can support um, those of you who may be living with a current um, chronic or serious illness um, and support uh, emergency situations between the home and the hospital. Next slide. There are many forms. They all have the same um, basic information and some go into greater detail. The one on the far left is the California state um, form. Uh, the others are different variations with the five wishes um, probably being the most extensive. It's a booklet with lots of information that you can put um, all your wishes in writing. So long as you are naming your healthcare agent um, and you're following the, the key steps and having uh, this witnessed as a legal document or notarized, um, it is a, a approved advanced healthcare directive in the state of California. If you are caring for someone outside the state, you would want to make sure that you um, look up on um, healthcare websites and advanced care planning for each state and make sure that you are completing the appropriate form for that state. Next slide. So in these forms, again, very quickly, but um, the main part, number one, designate your healthcare agent, you put their name and contact information there, and it's recommended that you have two alternates in, in the event that the person that you have designated is unwilling or unable at the moment of um, emergency need. Next slide. 
without designating someone to be your healthcare agent, without having an advanced healthcare directive, the doctors in an emergency situation um, and multiple family members, if they can be uh, found or identified, um, would be um, making decisions on your behalf and they wouldn't have the guidance from you. Um, and Lisa, I see the question there. The toolkit is available on our website. We'll reshare the link that's available to download for free for anyone that would like it. Next slide. The physician order for life-sustaining treatment is a form where you can completely um, complete the form and the areas of questions specific to cardiopulmonary resuscitation and medical interventions if you were outside of the um, healthcare system, if you were at home or in the community and your heart were to stop, if you're living with a serious condition or an illness where it may be likely that you could have a stroke or stop breathing, this is a physician order that you go to your physician and they will complete this form with your direction and conversation about exactly the questions we've been talking about. What would happen if, if this were to happen, would you want, what would the outcomes be of certain interventions? Um, this, the difference significantly, this is most often used um, by emergency uh, ambulance personnel outside of the hospital who without this are required to administer CPR um, en route to the hospital. If you know that that's not something you would want or you would want to discuss this with your physician, um, you speak to your physician and your physician must sign this form. Whereas the advanced directive naming your healthcare agent, you can have witnessed by friends, neighbors, um, or notarized without um, being a physician order. Next slide. And finally, when you have these things in writing, um, I know this is at warp speed, but you want to make sure that it's where it needs to be, um, that you have your healthcare agent has a copy, that your doctor or healthcare team have a copy, um, either the advanced healthcare directive, possibly and the doctor letter, um, your family and friends, those closest to you, um, that you have the conversation so that the people around you, the people closest to you who may be in a position to answer questions or support um, your wishes and values, know what matters most to you. In the toolkit, it also suggests, um, it's, it's another area to take charge of this, is to request that your advanced directives be included in your medical records with your general practitioner or your insurance company. Um, there are some healthcare systems that have their own online forms. I know Kaiser has one. Um, so if you are a member of different health plans, you can see if um, you can always request and require that this information be uploaded or included in your medical records. Um, and uh, you may be asked to complete it in their form. Next slide. So the four steps for advanced care planning, think about what matters most to you. Talk about this, um, become informed with any medical information that you might want or need to help you make decisions uh, with your family, with your friends, with your healthcare provider. Choose your healthcare agent, truly the single, uh, most significant step um, in this process, but they are all interconnected. Write down and document in the advanced healthcare directive and possibly the POLST form, what your wishes would be if you weren't able to speak for yourself and legally designating your healthcare agent to be your spokesperson in case of emergency. And as we are all doing this, hopefully earlier and earlier from 18 years old on, our choices may vary given different diagnoses. If symptoms were to change, if the location of where we could be cared for might change, 
If there's a death of someone who we've designated as a healthcare agent, if there's a divorce, um, and if there's a different disease progression. Each of these stages, this is not a do it once and you're done. Um, things can change, your decisions can change. And so we re re uh, recommend that you update these um, documents, whether it's every year, every five years, uh, depending on your age, so that you're sure it's current with your, your most current thinking in case of an emergency. Um, you can do this with your will as well. Um, and it's something that we, uh, rec we uh, recommend then that you uh, also keep a list of who has your current copy of an advanced directive so that you can make sure um, the most current versions are updated and uploaded into your health record and that your healthcare agent has that as well. With that, it is an incredible, uh, incredibly quick overview with some tips and tools and um, questions to consider. Um, next slide. Um, these four steps are simple steps, but they can take some time and review um, and to come back to. And we are most grateful for uh, the opportunity to share the information with you. And next slide. Um, both Mission Hospice and Home Care and the agencies that um, are on the Take Charge Toolkit, including Family Caregiver Alliance. And I think there was a, a comment about some of the resource health resource libraries in the area as well. Um, all of our agencies want to support and answer questions um, as well as providing the support and um, uh, direct services and care that each of our agencies do. So please, um, if you have additional questions, we have some time now, the Q&A, and uh, next slide. Um, the website is there. I think the chat box had a number of the resources mentioned, and I can answer, happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thanks, Mary. I just wanted to get started with one we have on the Q&A box here. They wanted to know if uh, a durable power of attorney is needed, if you have a medical power of attorney uh, advanced healthcare directive. Um, a durable power of attorney is a durable power of attorney for healthcare and there's a durable power of attorney for finances. So in your, in your question, um, you do need a durable power of attorney for both um, or either. And I'm not clear in your question if you have both, um, but you do want to make sure. Um, I see a question. I know what my, my wishes are. I don't want to be kept alive if I have any significant impairment, but isn't it the case that won't be enforced in California? Um, it's a, it's a big question. Um, the, that's the purpose of advanced care planning is to state in, in specifically in what questions, what situations you would not want to be kept alive on any, with any artificial means or even medications. Um, that is the purpose of your advanced directive. Uh, I'm not entirely sure if you're referring to, um, I need a little more clarity on the question. Okay, Mary, we have another question on someone who wanted to know uh, how they might go about, I guess, finding a local hospice if they're maybe outside of California or maybe just to, um, could be maybe in Southern California where they're not so close to Mission Hospice. Absolutely. Um, there are, um, there, all hospices are not created equal, I will say. Um, and so there are places where that you can learn about and find different hospices um, across the state of California or nationally. Um, nationally hospice, the National Hospice and Palliative Care Innovation Center, um, nphi.org nphi.org um, has a 
an 800 listing um, and a zip code listing for all nonprofit community-based hospices in the country. Um, so you will find resources there. Um, there um, the National Hospice and Palliative Care Organization, nhpco.org, uh, we'll get these all in the chat to you, um, also has listings of every hospice um, in the country. And um, it is important to check um, hospice quality scores, to interview hospices, to ask questions. There's a checklist of questions you can ask a hospice on Mission Hospice's website as well. Um, uh, and so, and you can also call our, um, our outreach staff and, um, and see about recommendations in other, uh, other areas as well. Um, there was a question there just because I was, um, uh, just because I was just speaking about that with, um, the nonprofit hospices, uh, what's the, what's the difference? There's a lot of, uh, publicity and media attention in California right now. Um, there are a number of, uh, in California, there are about 1200 hospices, um, fewer than 10% are community legacy hospices like Mission Hospice and Home Care. Um, there are some uh, reports. You know, hospice care can be good from anywhere with, so long as the, the staff and support systems are there and the values of the organization. Fundamentally, uh, for-profit hospices um, have a profit margin that they need to ensure for their shareholders and community-based nonprofit hospices. Um, I'll uh, bill the same from uh, Medicare and reinvest everything into community programs and staffing levels. Um, happy to share other resources on evidence around that should you be interested. Um, the question earlier on the end of life wishes are were about um, essentially um, speaking about the end of life option act or uh, physician assisted suicide or euthanasia. Um, California law uh, does support um, the end of life option act um, for people who would choose people in their last six months of life, the same criteria as hospice care, um, but also uh, to ensure conversations and um, treatment options if you would prefer to take advantage of that um, legislation in the state of California, you can absolutely choose the End of Life Option Act. It also takes pre-planning, multiple conversations and two physicians um, in, included. So um, there are conversations you should have with your physician um, and also the information about that. It is not something you can state in advance in your advanced directive, although you, you can state that it would be your wish, but the legal uh, the legislation around that act requires the conversations to happen at the time and your physician to um, support you at that time. Um, two other questions, do we have time? Yeah, I think I was just about to mention, I think we have time for just those last two, so that's perfect. Okay, great. Um, if you've completed an advanced directive um, and you want to, uh, choose a new healthcare agent or choose to update it, um, you can certainly, um, uh, you can just update, you can cross the date and put a new date, but you wanna make sure you do that on everyone's copy. Um, you can add appendices and update. You just wanna make it as simple for people as possible. Um, uh, going to appoint your son, um, Yes, uh, any suggestions on how to open the conversation specifically with younger people who have little experience with death or extreme illness? Um, it's wonderful that you want to appoint him. It's really opening a conversation, starting with why it matters to you. Uh, I can tell you most people have, uh, most 20 year olds do have experience with death or extreme illness, uh, maybe not in the way that you're considering with this. Um, and so uh, opening the conversation about what would matter with him, um, what matters to you, and if this is an area you can explore. 
I believe uh, we still have a video of Jessica Zitter and her family on our website. Um, and they learned things. If you start asking your son what he would want for his care in case of serious illness, um, that's also a good way to discuss that as well. Um, Last one I see very quickly, um, several people have said they assume if there's no health care agent has been chosen, the responsibility falls to a spouse or next of kin. Um, the, um, the difficulty is that um, there used to be a priority level of spouse or next of kin. Um, the, what happens in reality is if the spouse and the next of kin um, disagree, the reality of treatment um, discussions and challenges um, can actually end up in a court of law or ethics committees. It's not as straightforward as one person's voice would be taken over another and some very ugly cases have happened with that. Um, it, it is up to the, the healthcare team at the time. And um, as you can imagine, making that decision um, you, you may assume that a spouse, you would want them to preempt, and in other circumstances, the family you would, you would not want the spouse's wish to preempt. So healthcare teams are put in very difficult situations. It is always best um, to name who you would want to speak for you, and if you have circumstances that you think could get tense, um, to name who you don't want to be included in the decision making so that that is made uh, aware by the team as well. A lot of information, really great questions. Please get in touch um, directly um, for more. And thank you again to Calvin and Family Caregiver Alliance um, for offering this very important information. We hope it's helped you to take charge. Thanks so much, Mary. So yeah, I think that's just about all the time we have for questions today. I do want to get a quick poll started to um, get some feedback, see if we could, um, how we did today. But, um, other than that, thanks everybody for joining us. Uh, these FCA webinars are free. We do them every month. Next month, we'll actually be talking about some of these um, legacy caregiving awards that we do every year in um, in partnership with the Gilbert Associate, um, the Gilbert Foundation, and also Bader Philanthropies Inc. And we'll be interviewing the different uh, organizations that have um, won their awards, and we'll be able to hear about their programs. But you can find uh, more about Family Caregiver Alliance uh, webinars on our website, which is again caregiver.org, and our information is up on the screen. Um, so again, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for Mary. I know she's got to. Um, she has other things going on, so. But we'll leave the line open for um, any feedback you'd like. And um, other than that, please take care and thanks so much. And uh, I hope everyone stays safe. Thank you so much.